جمعية دار البر تقدم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع سنته إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome for yet another lecture in the family uh, gathering series of lectures this one entitled of course welcome well you know welcome you all to the raising children by love and kindness or with love and kindness now before i go into that that topic and to be honest it's quite a long topic so i've put together a list of certain uh, certain things i i hope we'll be able to cover them during the time and i hope that they at the same time as well uh we'll, we'll, we'll be able to cover the most important points but before we go into the topic of um you know the topic of raising children i uh, with love and kindness i feel it's very important at the same time to make sure that we discuss generally about raising muslim children and about finding a balance because there is two aspects there is the aspect of raising children with love and kindness and there is also the aspect that we are facing where how do we balance do we be, are we should we be, should we be very strict should we should we be relaxed you know where is the, where is the uh, as they would say the middle uh, the middle line so finding balance first of all um in raising muslim children now as we know islam is all about moderation and for everything that is permissible there is a reason and likewise with everything that is not permissible there is always a reason and it's always in our best interest so raising raising children as muslims definitely requires determination and zeal but a lot of love leniency is certain matters of course and being gentle and overall it requires self regulation because children are a reflection of their parents on one hand every muslim parent wants to raise good muslim sons and daughters and when they're the same calling each parent must do so in the light of islam so there are a few tips on how to pave this parenting uh, route the muslim way firstly and foremostly teach them about allah teach them about allah as parents we are granted children by allah's grace allah's grace only and children they're not ours to own but um you can say they are very much on loan to us until it's their time to return to allah so just like every single human being will eventually leave this world uh our children will also leave this world and of course they will be or we will be asked how we brought them up and a telling sign in reality of our success or failure as parents is on the day our children return to allah and whether or not they will be counted as members of jannah or otherwise imagine our children brothers and sisters being punished by allah we talk about when they're grown up and they've passed away because they have wrongly committed shirk as well as any other major sin and have not been able to repent and this mostly been out of ignorance or misguidance this here would be a clear failure as a muslim parent and is something we always need to contemplate teaching children about allah is a good reminder that no matter who we are unconditional obedience is only to allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and many parents um, pray for children to be obedient to them and while it is lauded for a child to be obedient to his or her parent obedience cannot overshadow the loyalty to allah basically if parents are transgressing the laws of allah then it's not right for the children to follow suit by teaching them to continue follow allah's commands what i mean by that is you know if the parent is clearly in front of the child not practicing as a good muslim not as they you know we always like to say they're not practicing what they preach if there's a fact then how do we expect the children or how it, i mean further more than that i would like to say how can we blame the children how can we blame these children well we tell them this is haram be like this but then they see you as a parent doing the opposite don't do this is just haram but you're doing it in front of them now we all have sins and we all have mistakes so we're not talking about being perfect 
But how can you go in front of your child and commit this sin or follow a certain lifestyle and expect the child to be other? We see this in many Islamic schools, sometimes in the tafi of the Quran memorization circles, sometimes in weekend Islamic schools. The parents dropping off their children because they want their children to become a havad, or they want to learn the religion, which is great. But when they go home, they go, you know, they're in the, they're in that lesson of learning about Allah, learning about the Sunnah, learning about being good and righteous, halal, what is halal to do it, what is haram to avoid it. And then they go home into an environment where it's the opposite of what they've just learned. So it's very important that the parent is a good role model. So you should set up a good environment, be a good role model. And setting a good Islamic environment is one of the most important factors in raising children. An environment that is always clean, loving, fun, and centered around the importance of the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is important for every parent to observe. Following the Prophet ﷺ's practices, for example, like eating food in moderation, studying, finding time for rest and entertainment, sleeping early, keeping clean. This will all help the children learn about Islam from the core. And Allah says in the Quran, worship Allah and join none with him in worship and do good to parents, kinsfolk, orphans, the poor, the neighbor who is near of kin, the neighbor who is a stranger, the companion by your side, the wayfarer you meet and those slaves whom your right hands possess. Verily, Allah does not like such as are proud and boastful. Surah al Nisa, verse 36, is the translation of the meanings. So we can see here Allah is saying to worship Him alone and then be good to parents, family, orphans, the poor, the neighbors, strangers who you come across in need of help. And so this is laying a foundation of good morals. But are we as parents? Uh, are we practicing this in our daily life? So remaining humble and patient during adversities is also an important lesson for children. How many times do we see parents, they may, um, something may happen in their life. They may, they may be shouting and screaming. And they got, you know, Allah forbid, they may even be swearing. What kind of examples are we setting for our children? So us remaining humble, us remaining patient in these fitting or these adversities, these trials, these tribulations, this is an important lesson that will show the children and how they should react. If we're acting violently, aggressively, screaming and shouting, then what in reality will all the children learn? Also, taking children out often and having help them help with charity work is a great way to install the love for Islam. We're on this platform right now, Dar al Burr a charity organization, get them into the simple activism of helping, raising money for the poor through the legitimate, obviously, charities, etc. It is also important to know that while teaching children to perform their salah and to read the Quran, it is very important for them to have a balanced life in order to fully reap the rewards of their potential. But at the same time, we must be, they, or the children must be constantly guided to stay away from activities that are not pleasing to Allah. This is a very important thing as well, that they are oft, always reminded to stay away from that which is displeasing to Allah. And the Prophet wasallam, he said, Allah will ask every caretaker about the people under his care, and the man will be asked about the people of his household, quoted Nasa in Abu Dawood. And Ali ibn Abu Talib, radiallahu anhu, he had a very nice... Uh, statement or very nice uh, you could say methodology uh, you know a life lesson uh, he advised to play with children when they are below the age of seven to teach them between the ages of seven and 14 and after to befriend them so we can see here he mentioned in the first seven years you know to uh, to you know to to let them play to let them have fun something you don't do any kind of education but this is a time for them, you know, they're very young. And then the real time to teach them is 7 to 14. And then he mentions from 14 onwards, be their friend. And anyone who has, has children, uh, grown-up children, will, will be able to relate to this. Because especially the teenage years of 14 and above, 
especially 14 to 20, 14 to 19, 14 to 18, it's a very, it's a very uh, stressful time, you could say, not necessarily for parents, for children. They're going through lots of changes. There's lots of temptations. There's lots of desires. There's lots of issues that are coming up. And this is a time where they really need a friend. And this is where it can be difficult for the parent as well to be able to, to be able to kind of take a step back and not be the one who's just saying, do this, don't do that, this is wrong, this is, but to try and while doing that, become a friend to the child. And this is, you know, this is something that, you know, no doubt is not easy, but if we try to keep this in mind, the advice of Ali ibn al-Falib, um, this is important. And it's why it's important to take note of their ages. You cannot treat a three-year-old the same as a 10-year-old, etc. So teaching a three-year-old to help with household chores, for example, or to memorize the Quran on a very structured basis may not be as effective as having an eight-year-old do the same thing. And similarly, um, uh, maybe I don't know, a 15-year-old who has been who has been never taught to pray will have more difficulties uh, getting the habit as a six-year-old who constantly watches his parents. And that reminds us of the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned to teach the children to pray at seven and to beat them or hit them when they reach the age of 10. And as we know, this is not the kind of beating which is a uh, physically damaging, beating, bruising. It's not a violent beating. Rather, it's that, it's that uh, kind of admonishing, uh, you could say, uh, slap or hit um, to make them understand that this is something that needs to be done, like, we, like parents do with so many other things. Um, and that's why it's important to start, not wait until the child turns to 10 and then start teaching them, or 13 or 15, and then complain and wonder why their child does not do the habit of praying five times a day. And it's never wrong, don't get me wrong, it's never wrong to teach children early on about Islam. But it's important to understand the levels of understanding, what they can comprehend, and their uh, maturity. And children who are pushed too early or too harshly may end up with a rebellious streak when they, when they feel that teachers of Islam were not accompanied with proper reasoning or understanding. And that's something as well. When you are forbidden the child, we focus on haram, 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 but we don't necessarily also say halal. We focus about jahannam and jah jahannam. What about jannah? It has to be balanced. We know in Islam, Islam is a religion of moderation. Islam is a religion of moderation. So if the parents are always so strict and so harsh, the child incorrectly, being you know human nature, they may grow to have this kind of I don't want to say the word eminity, but this kind of lack of enthusiasm towards Islam and acts of worship because of the way that the parents were very strict and very harsh. And we're going to come, obviously, later on, we're going to talk about some of the ways that we can raise our children with love, kindness, inshallah. And I'm, going to really, I'm really trying to fit this all in. So it's important to, you know, also let children, if they have certain, you know, hobbies or interest, you can tie that in within the, the, the realm of Islam. And we often say that there are many, uh, the reality is most things are halal. If we look at the majority of entertainment, now what comes to mind is the entertainment like music and partying and cinema and you know those ones. But what about all the other ones like horse riding and water sports and climbing and biking and martial arts? you know, that aren't punching in the face. So many things out there for children to do that are halal, but the shaitan and certain societies make us think that everything is haram. But in reality, if you count it, just like if you were to count drinks that were, you know, that were, were not allowed to drink, basically alcohol. And look at all the other drinks that we can, countless number of, um, of drinks that we can. So it's important to, to make the child understand that in reality, what we can't do is, which is haram, is very limited. And what is halal is very wide. But we have to help them to embrace and enjoy the halal things. If we tell them you cannot do this, it's haram. This is haram and this is haram. But we don't provide them with the same amount or more than that in halal activities, then they'll only understand everything is so strict, everything is so you know constrained, I can't do anything. And they see the other children enjoying these things, and eventually they start to go towards um, they go towards them. And of course, it's all got to be with compassion. The Prophet said, "Whoever has no compassion will not be um, 
treated with compassion. And he also said, you know, that, the, uh, that, that whoever does not have mercy, uh, have mercy upon those on the earth and the, the one uh, who is in the heavens will have mercy upon you. So what we must make sure we do, or should I say, put it this way, at the end of the day, it's important for parents to be reminded that we have to protect our families. That is very important. But we can do this protection and shielding them for that which is forbidden, that which is haram. We can still, obviously, and we have to do it with love, have fun, play with our children. And we need to be reminded of the real dangers of the world where we run into the excess of materialism, wastage of time and energy channeled into activities that are beneficial for us. But at the same time, it's important to teach children about Islam in a way that they can relate to it in moderation. The Prophet would do it with kindness and being gentle. And there is no point coercing a child to fast or to give in charity so much so he or she grows up disliking things that are good for him or her. And at the same time, it is not appropriate to make permissible something that is not permissible. So we cannot be too relaxed either, where we start to allow children to do things that are haram just to give in. And this is why we know that one of the verses Allah says that indeed that your um, that indeed that your wealth or your property and your wealth and your children are a, trip, a trial for you meaning this kind of situation when you bring a child up do you give in and let them go with the flow let them go with the so called crowd or do you uh, do you do your best of course that may, it may happen Allah will not judge you based upon what your child did if you told them and guided them in the right way for that which was which is uh, which is forbidden and it's always a great remind, great reminder for us that we have to be fair with our children we only have them for a short while like we mentioned on loan and we will only know whether we have done a good job and allah brings us forth from the judgment day and in the meantime we need to be fair and just towards them because it is allah who loves all that is fair and just and allah says in um the Prophet said actually, fear Allah and treat your children fairly, as reported in Bukhari Muslim. So that is an introduction, quite a long one, I do apologize. But I wanted to, I thought it was important to, excuse me. I thought it was important to be able to uh, emphasize some of the, before we go into some of the ways to be love them and raising them with love and kindness, we have to set down the essential criteria before we talk about so we've now had an idea of the criteria the general guidelines on raising children now we're moving on to how to add into this raising of children love and kindness and we're going to be doing this inshallah with giving examples all based upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so how we behave as adults often depends on how we were raised as children so how your child expresses his or her love for you depends on how you express your love for him or her. And we are the role models for our children. And when you express your love, it improves your relationship with that person. And the child will feel confident in your love. It's nothing like being loved to boost self-esteem. And there are many different ways to express your love. You can do it verbally, physically. And the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, constantly shows us how he was not only expressive in terms of love with his wives and friends, but also with children. So following, so the following are some of the ways that we're going to mention you can copy the Prophet Sallallahu follow his sunnah, inshallah, and by the will of Allah, see your relationship with your children blossom and get better, inshallah. And the mission of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, well, one of you loves his brother, then let him inform him of it in Tirmidhi. So first of all, speak your love. Now we know as a parent, you do everything for your child that should be considered love, right? But consider expressing your love as following a sunnah. And inshallah, it will get easier to express more. Just saying, I love you more often. Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asked three times, where is the small child? Then he said, call Al-Hasan ibn Ali. So Al-Hasan ibn Ali got up and started walking with a necklace of beads around his neck. Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, stretched out his hands. And Al-Hasan did the same. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, embraced him and said, oh Allah, I love him. So please love him and love those who love him. In Sahih Bukhari. So the first thing that comes to mind when we hear this is, 
you think of telling someone that you love them is to say, I love you. Three simple little words that sometimes we find it very hard to say, but can have a power to strengthen relationships into a tight bond. If you love your children, then let them know through words, say, I love you often. Or you can also do this through positive affirmations. So another way to verbally express your love is to give positive affirmations, such as, for example, you're my loving son and daughter, or you brighten my day. And also give positive feedback that, you know, lets them know or shows them your love for him or her. This can be said with pretty simple things like, I appreciate your help. I love it when you hug me. And Charlotte, if we try to do this more often, Inshallah, we will see that, you know, children generally open, will open up to you more, but they will also express their love for you more as well. Also, not just saying the love, showing the love. So a reassuring physical touch can make a huge difference. One of the reasons Allah has given us a skin is that we can feel with it. So physical expressions of love, such as kissing, hugging, patting of backs, stroking the head, holding or squeezing of hands, it also includes it also includes things like um, uh, encouraging gestures like a thumbs up or a wink in the eye or smiling. And Allah's Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam showed his affection for them in many ways. He used to hug them, he patted them on the back, he touched their heads, combing their hair with his fingers, uh, etc. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi would kiss his children. He sallallahu alaihi wasallam took Ibrahim his son kissed him and smelled him as reported in Al-Bukhari. So this hadith you mentioned shows how kissing your children is a sunnah. And then there's another hadith that shows us that it's been related to the amount of mercy and kindness you have in your heart. Aisha radiallahu anha, she reported that there came a few desert Arabs to Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And he said to them, do you kiss your children? And he sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, yes. Thereupon they said, by Allah, but we do not kiss our children. And then Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, then what can I do if Allah has deprived you of mercy? What is Sahih Muslim? So this shows that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was shocked. This Bedouin man, these Bedouin men said, we never kiss our children. And he said, what can I do if Allah has taken mercy out of you? So we can see here, if you are a parent now, especially maybe on the male side, you're not showing this affection, thinking that this is masculine or manly, and this is for the women, you're obviously wrong because there was no one who was more uh, balanced and masculine and, and manly like than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the best in every aspect you can imagine, in every characteristic, in every mannerisms. He was the best. Allah said that he is of the most noble of character. So this is something that we need to work on. And love isn't just exclusive to small children. Al-Bara added, and then I went with Abu Bakr into his home, carrying a saddle. And there I saw his daughter Aisha lying in a bed because of heavy fever. And I saw her father, Abu Bakr, kissing her cheek and saying, how are you, little daughter? Also, you can do it, brothers and sisters, through hugs. Aisha, radiallahu anha, reported Zayd ibn Haritha, came to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa when he was in her house. Zayd knocked at the door, and the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa rose to receive him, trailing his garment. He embraced and kissed him, reporting it terminally. So, another, many, many hadith. Uh, another hadith shows how the Prophet ﷺ would love children of all creeds, race, color. Usama ibn Zayd was a son of Abyssinian slave woman, Um Ayman, and a freed slave, Zayd ibn Haritha. And it was narrated by Usama ibn Zayd that Allah's Messenger وسلم, used to put me on one of his thighs and put Al Hassan bin Ali on the other thigh. And then embrace us and say, Oh Allah, please be merciful to them as I am merciful to them in Bukhari. So we see here his relative and his non relative. Someone of a, of a descent of a slave, someone from the noble Prophet family. He had them equal on his thing and he hugged them and he made dua for them. Also, giving them respect, brothers and sisters. Respect is a two way street. And when you choose to, to model mutual respect, You'll be well on your way to raising respectful children, inshallah. Aisha radiallahu anha said, I did not see anyone who was more resembled, who more resembled the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a manner of speaking than Fatima. When she came to him, he stood up for her, made her welcome, kissed her, and had her sit in his place. When the Prophet came to her, she stood up for him, took his hand, made him welcome, kissed him, and made him sit in her place. She came to him during his final illness. 
and he greeted her and kissed her and supported the adab al mufrad. This is a perfect example of how children treat parents based on how they are treated, because we as parents are their first school of love and kindness. In a world where we lack common courtesies, how can we teach our kids to be respectful, both respectful to us and to other children and adults? And the answer is that we have to be the model of respect we hope to see from our kids. And we have to make them feel valued and capable. And we have to help them in these struggles. And something that you know also comes to mind is that we often uh, lack that. You know, we really do sometimes lack that affection, uh, the hugging, kissing, uh, being, being gentle. Sometimes we all, you know, and that's why you, sometimes you find children who stop practicing and, and kind of go away from Islam, and you find it's because the parents were extra strict, not within the guidelines of Islam. I'm talking about that, that it's not strict. And even the child thinks it is. Obviously, the child grows up thinking that this is a mistake. But the way that the parents did it, the way that the parents did it, and there are many examples, um, and, and, you know, that where the Prophet ﷺ, um, which I will come to, but, you know, we, we remember the Prophet ﷺ, how he took, how he treated the Bedouin man who urinated in the mosque. And we will see an example coming up, inshallah, of something similar that a child did and how the Prophet ﷺ reacted. Also, giving them gifts. As parents, we, always, we are always buying things for our children. And it's not about the, you know, material, you know, accumulation of toys and clothing or satisfying our child's every woman's fancy for the latest thing. Instead, it should be about giving with love, whatever you give, especially giving of our love. And as Ibn Malik said, that a woman came to Aisha, and Aisha gave her three dates. She gave each of her two children a date and kept one date for herself. The children ate the two dates, and then they looked at their mother. She took her date and split it into two and gave each child a half of it. The Prophet Sallallahu came and Aisha told him about it. He said, are you surprised at that? Allah will show her mercy because of her mercy towards her child, as reported in Al-Adab al mufrad So if you give your child a toy, then make sure you spend time to play with the toy with that child. If you give your child a book, then try and sit and read that book to them. It's more about the love that you can both share with the gift. Children often crave your attention more than the gift itself, but do we give it to them? That is the question. And also giving a, a gift of, I don't know, loving names or nicknames, calling them these friendly, loving names. The Prophet Sassam used to call people around him with love. He would call them with the names and kunya that they liked the best. For example, calling Zaynab bin Salama, his stepdaughter, Zawainam, calling Adirah and Abu Turab, calling Asha, Aj'ash, or Humaira, etc. But also, if you have more than one children, or more than one child, maintaining justice or equality while giving gifts. So we as Muslims should be conscious about treating children, especially sons and daughters, equally and justly. Allah's Messenger said, be afraid of Allah and be just to your children, according to the Bukhari. Also, we should spend quality time with them. Anas ibn Malik walked by some children and greeted them. And uh, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu used to do that in al Muslim. So he was imitated by Prophet Sallallahu How many of us, we don't even say sometimes salam or communicate with our own children properly let alone other children. So when you spend quality time with your child, it tells him or her that you love being with him or her. Being able to spend time with your loved ones is very important to any relationship. And I'll reiterate it here that children crave their parents' attention. Children need and they want their parents' attention or their negative or positive attention. And most of the time, parents give their children negative attention by focusing on what their children shouldn't do. And this will only reinforce the negative action. Parents should instead focus on giving children their positive attention. And one way to do this, brothers and sisters, is to spend quality and even quantity time together. And it was narrated that Abu Tayyah said, I heard Anas ibn Malik say that the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to mix with us so much that he said to a little brother of mine, oh Abu Umair, what happened to the Nughair? which is a small bird that he used to play with. So he always was playing with them, being friendly with them. Another thing, play and pray with them. So children don't understand hidden love. Or, you know, you have love, but you're not showing it. They don't understand it. They don't understand that. They don't know that that love is there if it's hidden. And the same for, uh, you know, uh, for many things. So 
you need to express your love openly for them in every little thing. And they thrive. They, you know, children love during play instead of being burdened with too much organization and extracurricular activities. And the Prophet Sallallahu would have fun with the children, make them laugh, play with them. And Sunnah always encourages simplicity, a simple life with plenty of time to play. And it was narrated by Mahmoud ibn Rabia. When I was a boy of five, I remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took water from a bucket with his mouth and threw it on my face, in Putin al-Bukhari, and the, the water. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always patient and considerate with children. It was narrated Abdullah ibn Shaddad that his father said the Messenger of Allah came out to us for one of the nighttime prayers and he was carrying Hassan or Hussein. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, came forward and put him down. And then he said the takbir and started to pray. He prostrated during the prayer and made the prostration lengthy. My father said, I raised my head and I saw the child on the back of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, while he was prostrating. So I went back to my prostration. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finished praying, the people said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, you prostrated during the prayer for so long that we thought something had happened or that you were receiving a revelation. He said, No such thing happened, but my son was riding on my back and I did not like to disturb him until he had enough, according to the Sa'i. And, you know, as we mentioned before, we mentioned the statement of Ali bin Abi Talib about, uh, about the playing. Uh, uh, you know, playing with them and then teaching them and then being their friend. And uh, Ya'al ibn Marra said, we went out with the Prophet وسلم, and we were invited to eat. Hussein was playing in the road and the Prophet وسلم, raced the people and then spread out his arms. The boy began to run this way and that and the Prophet made him laugh until he caught hold of him. He put one of his hands under his chin and the other on his head and then embraced him in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. And this is something, brothers and sisters, I really, really recommend that all of you try to read Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. And inshallah, there's a big possibility that soon I'll be starting a weekly class on Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, an amazing book. And you could loosely, it, basically, Al-Adab, which is manners or mannerisms or characteristics, Al-Mufrad, you know, basically how to deal with individuals, how to deal with parents, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim, neighbors, family, an amazing, amazing book. And then also how to deal with everyday interactions you may have with people. And this was collected by uh, Imam Muslim, uh, sorry, Imam al-Bukhari. Uh, it is an amazing book. So I definitely, it's definitely a great book to take lessons on how to deal with people and everyday life and society, inshallah. Continuing, being patient with them. Prophet Sallallahu took a child in his lap for tehnik. This is where they chew a date when the baby's born and put it in the mouth of a child. The child urinated on him. What did he do? Did he get very angry and scream and shout and puffing and puffing? No, of course not. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rather, he asked for water and he poured it over the place of the urine. Uh, he didn't get annoyed. He didn't uh, get angry at the mother. He just simply solved the solution. And the Prophet Sallallahu tolerant towards children tells how he never expected children to act like adults. He knew that children take time to grow and learn. And this is a process of Allah. So let life grow slowly and steadily. So when you feel angry, angry, which is natural, follow the steps of the Prophet Wasallam. Instead of shouting at a small child, do not touch an object, for example, stay away from a dangerous area. All the while being ignored by the child and then subjecting them to a long lecture to correct their mistakes, physically removing them from harm, briefly explaining the way, maybe even hitting them, unfortunately. So what is better is if, um, for example, there was a time when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was a big collection of dates that were collected and Hassan al Hussein were playing with these dates. One of them took a date and put it in his mouth. And Allah Sallallahu Alaihi looked at him, he took it from his mouth and said, don't you know that Muhammad's offspring do not eat what is given in charity? So he removed it and he explained to him. He didn't scream and shout and then make a big lecture. So when our children constantly see us angry with them because of what they did wrong, Either they brand themselves as a bad child, which is, which is deterrent to their positive growth, or they simply brand us as bad parents in their mind, which is a deterrent of a positive relationship. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, the best women are the riders of the camels, and the righteous among the women of Quraysh. They are the kindest women to their children in their childhood, and the most careful women of the property of their husbands in Bukhari. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would use a combination of physical touch and gentle reprimanding words to make children realize their mistakes. 
he knew that it was natural for children to get distracted from an errand by games. And Anas said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, was one of the best men of character. And one day he sent Anas to do something. And Anas said, I swore by Allah that I would not go, but in my heart I felt that I should go to do what the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had commanded me. So I went out, I came upon some boys who were playing in the street. All of a sudden the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had come up behind me, caught me by the back of the neck. And when I looked at him, he was laughing. He said, go where I ordered you, little Anas. I replied, yes, I am going, O Rasulullah. Anna said, I swear by Allah, I served him for seven or nine years, and he never said to me about a thing which I had done. Why did you do such and such? Nor about a thing which I left. Why did you not do such and such? As reported in Abu Dawood. So sometimes, brothers and sisters, we have to let go. And this is the closing advice. Narrated Umm Khalid, the daughter of Khalid ibn Sa'id. I went to Allah, the sallallahu alayhi wa with my father, and I was wearing a yellow shirt. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Sana Sana and Abdullah the narrator said that this meant good in Ethiopian language. I then started playing with the seal of prophethood in between the Prophet's shoulders and my father rebuked me harshly for that and Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to leave her and then Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam invoked, made dua to Allah to grant her a long life by saying three times, wear this dress since it is worn out and then wear it since it is worn out and then wear it as it's worn out. And the narrator adds, it is said that she lived for a long period wearing that yellow dress till its color became dark because of long wear, which is Bukhari. So know that love is in little things, brothers and sisters. Sometimes it's in words. Sometimes it's in gifts. Sometimes it's smile and laughter. Sometimes it's, it's even letting go. So much of peaceful parenting, it lies in letting things go. Letting go of the mess that they make in the area you just clean. Letting go of the wall that they painted out of creative curiosity. Letting go of the book they drew on out of imagine, you know, out of their imagination. Letting go of the bad grades they scored in school. And the list goes on. Remember that angels are not even writing their sins yet until they're adults. So even if they deliberately break a precious piece of crockery or touch anything in the cupboard or drawers, whatever it may be, that you've told them to stay away, remember that their deeds are not being written, but surely our deeds, us as parents, our deeds, our words, our actions are truly being written down. And this idea of letting go is to find solutions together. It doesn't mean you're spoiling your child, but it simply means that not spoiling ourselves in the process, not burying our souls in the process, not forgetting to be patient in the process and not losing our temper in this process. <coughs> and this, brothers and sisters, is basically the end of today's session. So we started off by understanding the importance of what we need to focus on as guidelines as parents. That's how we started. And then we went down uh, and we mentioned the whole aspect of uh, the most important steps and then we moved on to how we should act with them with love and kindness and some very practical tips and every tip from sisters we gave today as you saw every tip was from the guidance of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and inshallah for that i am not sure if we have questions and answers inshallah so i will check now inshallah and i leave you uh, by sending peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Okay, one question I can see here. Um, please mention the name of the book. I'm assuming you're talking about the book I mentioned of written by Sahih al uh, Imam al Bukhari. Now there are not many translations of it, to be honest. I only found one, so I'm not recommending the. It's, it's, it's translated by the UK Islamic Academy. I'm not recommending any other books of theirs. I don't know anything about them. So don't take this as a um, don't take this as a recommendation for the society, but they're the only ones I know of who have translated it. And the name of the book is Al Adab Al Mufrad. Al Adab Al Mufrad. Um, I hope that's done. Uh, uh, Jibril, inshallah, is is okay to my knowledge, from what I remember from the scholars, is the name of Jibril is okay, inshallah. Wallahu alam. Are there any online classes at the moment? Uh, we don't have. Uh,
classes. I'm not sure. There are some online classes. Sorry, yes. We have, you can go to um, Islamic uh, DX, Islamic IC DXB. There are classes now with Sheikh Faras al Hamadi for boys and girls. I believe that it's just started. I can even, while I'm here, I had it on my phone. So I want to make sure that I can give you the information, inshallah, while it's still here. Um, bear with me, inshallah. Don't want you to, uh, and maybe the team as well, maybe they're going to type as well, I'm not sure. Um, they, maybe, the, maybe the team, they can also type the answer. Um, I'm just looking for it, bear with me. Um, Islamic ICDXB, which is we'll, in cooperation with, um, I'm not finding it here, but there is a new program with Sheikh Faras al Hamadi in the English language designed for uh, children from 8 to 14. Uh, inshallah, they should be typing it here. Um, but that I believe that will also be broadcast via Islamic ICDXB. Uh, so please advise us on how to deal with abusive parents. Jazakallah khair. Um, I, I, mean, I don't know how old you are. Um, I don't know how old you are, to be honest. So that could be a difficult one. But whatever the case, um, parents need to be dealt with the utmost respect. If they abuse you, you can't abuse them back. You have to um, do your best to deal with it. Um, it depends, you know, again, it depends, again, about the, uh, the abuse. How abusive is this? Is it abuse that um, is physical? Or you're being beaten badly? Or is it more verbal abuse? That depends. Of course, if the child is being, the, or the child or a teenager or whoever it may be, is being beaten physically severely, then that's obviously something for the competent authorities. Um, but if it's a, a verbal abuse, then the person has to take it. And every time they take some kind of abuse or some harshness from their parents that is unjust, then they will be rewarded. One, you know, this is the level of reward is, you know, really quite, you know, amazing for the person who, uh, you know, with this, you know, uh, the urge to want to respond, the urge to want to answer back, but they don't because of the status of the parents is a, an amazing reward. So that's just in a nutshell, because, you know, it all depends on how abusive and what kind of abuse. So I'm just talking generally. Can you recommend books to teach children about Islam? Good question. There are some very basic books. I would start with a very nice book, actually, that um, is by... Um, Sheikh Muhammad Jamil Zino, you'll find this in Dar es Salaam. It's a very simple book, but a very amazing book at the same time. And it's called What a Muslim Believes. What a Muslim Believes. And it has all the important things about Islamic belief uh, in, in a form of question and answers. That's the book I would recommend to start with. And you can find other similar books. I'm just, uh, bear with me because I just remembered now that I believe I have, because I know somebody's asking, when does this question... They're asking when do the classes start, and I'm pretty sure that they're referring to, um, which I'm not finding for some reason. The uh, Sheikh Faras al Hamadi. Um, but as far as I know, these courses are, are, are maybe just about started or um, are going to start, inshallah. What do you do if your children are acting mean, jealous, and bullying each other, putting each other down? Mm, difficult one. You need, with the gentle consequences, there needs to be, a, again, I don't know how old they are. If they're old enough to understand, you need to try, like we mentioned here, try to take which the child that's acting mean and jealous and bullying, try to take them aside and explain to them what they're doing is wrong. And then try to say and explain to them on the opposite side what they are supposed to be doing. And how that this is bad and how this is good. And then try to tie that into the fact that Allah dislikes it when the person does this. But Allah loves it when the person is like this. And this is, the, the, this is not a good characteristic. And um, this is a good characteristic. Along those lines. Again, it's a very detailed thing. But this is just a general guideline. 
uh, can we get recording for session? I believe, inshallah, this will be uploaded to the Islamic Information Center Dubai YouTube channel. Islamic Information Center Dubai YouTube channel. Uh, if I can, which you'll find on YouTube. Um, you'll find it on YouTube, inshallah. Excuse me, I'm just, uh, yeah, yeah, it's literally Islamic Information Center. Um, Islamic Information Center Dubai. But do we have an assignment to attend at the end of the month or the year? Um, they're, not to my knowledge, no. There's various lectures that are related to family topics or family matters. It's, that's why we call it the family gathering. So it's pretty much every week there's something like that. Should we push a child to memorize in age 10 where she finds it hard? She seems less interested in it. Again, it could be uh, a different, it could be a different, per child, every child is different. Some children are very like uh, receptive, some are not so receptive, some pick things up fast, some pick things up slow. Everyone's different. Everyone's, you know, unique and alhamdulillah, great in their own way. So if you're finding your child is less interested, try to reduce it. Uh, it depends as well how you're this memorization. If you're sending them for a daily class for one hour, that's pretty manageable. They may find it hard. Try to reward them. Remember we mentioned about gifts? Give them gifts. And the scholars have mentioned there's no issue in giving gifts, chocolates, sweets, toys, for a child who's memorized Quran. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's a natural thing for a child. Just like you do that, you know, if you want them to do something else, or you might bear them a gift when they win a football match or whatever it may be. Likewise, even more so when they've memorized something in the religion or the Quran. For example, with my own children, I wanted them to attend an online course that would take them maybe two or three months. I said to them, if you're going to finish this course, first of all, you need to learn this course. It's pretty good. It refreshes the basics. It's essential things you have to know about as a Muslim. But if you complete it, I'll give you a thousand dirhams. I don't know, or 500 dirhams, 100, 200 pounds, for example, or, or a, few, you know, a couple hundred dollars or whatever it may be. Uh, and I found that my ch children, that gave them the encouragement um, to do so. Uh, yes, that is the book, Sister Emma. Yes, Imam Bukhari al adib al-Mufrad. That's correct. And inshallah, I, I, I don't know if it will be through this platform, um, but the, the plan is to start some weekly classes on al adib al-Mufrad. If we can do it in a way where people can also attend uh, online, it will be great, inshallah. We'll keep, uh, keep looking out for, um, you know, Either Darul Bur, either the Telegram groups, etc., that you would have, or however you found out about this, as well as the Islamic ICDXB, uh, Islamic Information Center, Dubai on YouTube, uh, Instagram, etc. Uh, up to what age does a person need to raise children? In reality, you know, up until the age of they become young men, you know, like they're all young women, they're like 18, 19, 20. But it doesn't mean we let them go. We don't, you know. By then, they should have already been raised. But you kind of always continue. And I remember Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, I heard that he used to, every day for Fajr, call all of his children in their houses. You know, they're, they're, they're married, they have their, they're living by themselves. He would call all of them to try and wake them up, you know, to wake them up for Fajr. So there's always continuous, just like we as adults, we have to advise other adults, other Muslims. We have to you know, forbid the evil and enjoying the good and forbid the evil in a way that we are capable to do so. This needs to be an ongoing thing, reminding the child, advising the child, even if they're adults. But obviously it's a bit different when they become a full-grown adult There's and they become, they move out of the house or they become grown up. There's obviously, it's less easier, fortunately, to be able to, uh, to control the how and when uh, or, you know, or con to control them. But the, the raising of children never quite stops. The advising and the, you know, uh, you know, the advising of them and trying to help them and trying to educate them. Now, this is a big problem. How to handle a child when the child is being compared with other children in the family and the child is having a negative impact. This is, this is wrong. See, this is what should not happen. Do not compare that child to this child and then say, oh, look, at he's so good. Look at you, you're so bad. This is, this is a disaster. And we may have all done it. I'm not saying, you know, like, look at me, I'm the perfect parent or, you know, maybe we've all done this. But if you're doing that as a regular thing, stop it. Make that child understand that they have, they are unique in their own way. They have their own special thing. They are this, they are that. Show them love. 
but try to explain to them that when they do certain things that they get rewarded for it or you know and try and advise them to you know it depends what this comparison is if the other child is getting better grades whatever it may be just try to encourage them but don't ever say to them you know like oh you know look at your brother he's so good what about you this is a no-no big 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 problem I don't know of any counselor who can do parenting counseling. Uh, personally, I don't know. Allah uh, What do you do when you act lovingly to your kids that they don't act lovingly to each of you? E, I, you speak kindly, they yell at you. This is also um, also a difficult thing because it, again, it depends on the age. If they're very small children, then you can try the typical punishments like sending them to their room, making them stand in the corner, you know, sitting down with them, explaining to them why this is wrong, and you, adult, you know, children don't show to adults. If they're older, like teenagers. Again, it's a problem. And this is something that happens many places. Uh, it's very difficult. Um, you kind of, I mean, as a parent, you also have to have patience. It's not going to be easy. You know, eventually they always say, Allah alam, generally speaking, that if you if you're correct with your children, they eventually will come back. So if they're going through a phase of yelling and being rebellious, they will inshallah return. <clears throat> They will turn to the right way, inshallah. Please share the online class details. I'm not quite sure which online class uh, you're referring to. If it's about the one I said I may be starting in Adab al Mufrad, that's yet to be confirmed, inshallah. Probably within the next two to four weeks, inshallah. Um, oh, one second. Yeah, this is also a difficult one. I mean, and I don't know if I'm the best to deal with it because I'm not in that situation. But this is asking how do we, how are we going to show our love or guide them properly if the parent is physically far from the children especially those parents who need to work abroad though we love our kids but for them it will not be enough just to hear the word that's very difficult i mean you can only do what you can you can only do what you can uh, and i it's very hard for me to advise because you know you know like they say if you're not in that situation you don't really understand it so it, it, it could be really easy for me to say go back home more often but you may not you know, it might not be financially financial, financially uh, possible to go home more often. I may say, bring them here. Might, that also might not be possible. So it's very difficult. I mean, you can only do what you can. The more you say to them you love them, you care them, the better. They may, like, uh, act a bit funny with you because they're missing you and they feel like you're not in their life. But you explain to them, I'm only here because I'm providing money so you can have a good life. And if I come back, it will be different. And you can try and explain to them the reason. And at the same time, you try your very best. And like I said, it's really difficult for me to say that, but to go back home and be with them when you can. Yeah, so I just how to deal with a teenager because it's very crucial age. A bit, you know, as we mentioned in the lecture, the advice of Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, that he said, be with your child in the first years, play with them, like the first seven years. They're seven to 14, teach them. As in more advanced, obviously, not leaving them for like seven years doing nothing Islamic, but you know, the general thing. Then 14 onwards, be their friend. This is it here. You kind of have to like change that authoritative, I'm the parent, do as you're told, because this teenager is going through all kinds of crazy hormones. They feel that they are an adult, they feel that they know better than you. A lot of bad influences they see from all over the place. The crazy stuff we, that goes on social media that we can't even imagine, you know, what goes on, you know, uh, the, the, sometimes what they may watch on television, if they, you know, so they have a lot of like, everything is on their head. They're getting hit left, right and center by all kind of, kind of crazy stuff, to be honest. So, like you said, it's a very crucial age. Be their friend. Be their friend. So when you try to advise them, try to do it as a friend is advising them. Try, even if they might not take it from you and you still see them fall into certain behavior, if it's sort of like crazy, crazy behavior, like they're doing drugs or they've completely abandoned Salah 100%, you know, something, then just try, try like we said there, try and let go. Advise them. Try to show to them, you know, that you're not angry with them. You don't hate them. You don't think they're evil or something like that. You know, you're trying to advise them as a friend. Uh, second. I mean, there's a question here about father beating children, that kind of thing. I'm not sure if I'm the best person to do it, but if you if you've done whatever you can to protect the child, and it seems you have, then you are not a bad parent, inshallah. Um, 
And of course, it's just generally speaking, Islamically, the, the beating is supposed to be that that doesn't leave marks on the body. They call it in Arabic, غير مبرح, you know, مبرح, sorry, غير مبرح, that it's not, it doesn't leave a mark. And this is it's not me saying this, this scholars, when you see these scholars that talk about disciplining children, you know, they will say that it's not, you know, when they talk about allowing to discipline the child, they say there should be no bruising, should be no breaking of the skin, no bleeding, no scratching. It's not, it's not a beating to literally beat them, <laughs> you know, like beat the living daylights, as they say, out of them. It's a, a kind of a, a physical hit just to let them know that you're upset with them. It's not like this violent beating, uh, et cetera. So if you have done your best in whatever way you can, or you can't do anything, then inshallah, Allah Adam, you're not inshallah, uh, you know, a bad parent because you know that we know that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever sees a, 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 an evil, either if he's able, then he changes it with his hand, and if he's not able, he changes it with his tongue, and if he's not able, then he hate he he changes it in his heart, meaning he hates it in his heart, and that is the the lowest of iman in this. So if a person is unable to stop it physically or verbally, but he hates this thing in the heart. Inshallah, you know, that's everyone does it according to their ability. What was the author for the book? What a mission should believe? I, I don't know. Oh, sorry, what a Muslim should believe. Muhammad Jamil Zino, Rahimullah, passed away, I think, around 10 years ago, was an, a Syrian scholar, one of the students, I remember, if I recall correctly, of Sheikh Al-Bani, and he was a he was a professor or a teacher in um, the uh, uh, Jam al uh, in, in Mecca, the Jam al Hadith al Khairi, or something like this, one of the uh, institutes in a, in Mecca, what a Muslim should believe. Again, if someone said a lot of parent depends on marriage, definitely. If you're fighting and screaming and insulting each other and having a bad marriage in front of the children, of course, no doubt they'll have a negative. Um, and they are, they are vulnerable and helpless, and they will pick up these negative things, and the parents are to blame for that. These things need to. It's not easy always, but the very best needs to be taken away from the children. Okay, as a teacher, how to advise, sorry, as a teenager, this is a teenager who's asking this question, how to advise my parents to stop doing bid out when I teach them, they ignore me. Brother, you have done your job. You've explained to them, you've explained to them about the bid out. You've explained, inshallah, hopefully with evidence and explaining to them, and they continue, leave them. Maybe try to go back in a in a later stage. And this came, of course, because they're your parents, it's, a, it's very difficult as well. You can't be too forceful with them, right? So you can only go and you know, you can go to them and say, Mom, Dad, you know, I love you guys, you're my parents, you know. And uh, you know, you know, I've come across this, you know, authentic information that this particular thing you're doing is not established by the Prophet, and I love you. I don't want any, I wouldn't want you to do anything, you know, anything that goes against the Sunnah. And I know I'm your son. I know you're much older, you're much wiser than me, but I came across these very old classical scholars that said this, you know, that, that kind of thing. And if they continue, just take a step back. Don't be like one of those, a lot of teenagers, a lot of people, they become religious, they get a bit extra zealous. They go there, they go there. And this, even the scholars they mention about that guy who becomes religious, and he walks into his house and says, television is haram. He takes his television and throws it out the window. And they talk about this as being extremism. It's not the way to do it gentle reminding from time to time you know not coming home and throwing out the window what are they going to think the parents and the brothers and sisters of this person what happened to this guy has gone crazy it's step by step as they say slowly slowly so if you've advised them take a step back try maybe in a in a in a, in a few months or whatever it may be to go and tell them again but uh, just like me i may have a non-muslim parent for example I became Muslim, so my parents are not Muslim, or someone's parents aren't Muslim. You cannot go to them like every week and keep giving them dawah, 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 dawah. You have to do it from time to time, try and open up the topic. And based upon how they react, you either continue or take a step back. I say, you know what? I've noticed I keep going every week. My dad's getting really angry. I'm going to, you know, take a step back because the more angry, the more they're going to be defensive. And don't forget, they're always going to have the attitude of, we're the parents, we know better than the son. It's always going to happen. It's a natural reaction. So you, you don't want them to completely be pushed away from you. They'll never accept advice from you. Okay, my mother and father always tell my brother to pray salah in the masjid, but he does not listen no matter what. 
how should we deal with the mother? Again, I don't know how old the child is, but generally speaking, generally speaking, um, they should keep advising him. I don't know how old he is. If he's young enough to be like punished and like take away this, take away their mobile phone, take away this. And if it, or he's old enough to be encouraged, like, you know, go to the masjid to get ordered by Allah, you know, and maybe, you know, give him some incentive, that could work. At the end of the day, I mean, the most important thing is he's praying. Of course, he should be in the masjid. But even if he's praying at home, uh, due to, you know, the most correct opinion is that he would be sinful for not, you know, answering the call to prayer and going to the mosque. But his prayer, inshallah, at home is still accepted and valid. So if you think that maybe pushing him to go to the masjid, he may then rebel and stop praying. That's, a, that's also, a, it's, a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult balance. Allahu alam. Um, Allahu alam. Um, but I would say that you just keep on reminding him. You know, I'm, I'm not giving fatal, of course. I'm giving advice. They should keep on, just keep on reminding him. Again, it really depends on the age. Really depends on the age. Okay, mashallah, so many questions. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to a father who is never around for his children and wife, but gives all the time attention to the only first household children from his ex-wife? There has to be a. There has to be. You know, we know when it comes to children, it has to be equality. It has to be equal. I mean, even just from the aspect of that, the children who are not being treated equally or attention this is going to have very detrimental effect on them and you know like we said the father or the parent will be asked about so if there's less attention being given and that less attention could result in those children being less religious less well behaved anything negative should be on the responsibility of the father on his account because he is you know you're all a shepherd or a caretaker yeah the one about the spouse um Again, it's very difficult. Very, these things are very difficult to deal with. Gen, you know, you can only generally speak. Definitely, not reacting is very good. So there's less toxicity in front of the children, and definitely, um, definitely, uh, that is rewarded for sure. Inshallah, because one, you know, you're reducing the you're reducing the the fitna or the the, the the evil by not responding so that's definitely has a good effect again teaching to accept in humiliation indirectly i i really the, the i mean the husband needs to be advised on don't yell and humiliate in front of the children examples we gave you know we can but it depends i mean this is the on the individual the person should be maybe explained how the process i sell them would deal with his wives and how he would be gentle with them and how he would uh, how he would um, help them and so it's a, I don't know it's a very difficult situation again these situations maybe you try to get someone from the family to sit down with you both and try and discuss it it's, it's difficult but generally speaking try and advise the husband I'm sure it's not all arguing there must be times where the relationship is good and try to very with wisdom try and remind him or tell him how this will have a neg negative effect on the children. And, you know, it's never good for children to see parents fighting and, and that kind of thing. That's the only thing I can really, I can really, um, really think of. Let me just check if there's anything else. I think that seems to be, inshallah. Yeah, I think, inshallah, we will, uh, let me just double check. There's nothing else. Oh, there. I think we'll have to stop soon anyway because it may, may they may not stop coming. Let me just try these last two. Please have more courses for kids and parents on marriage and parenting because shaitan attacked the society through this school. Inshallah, we um, I mean the 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 um, admin or the organ, organ you know the the department inshallah is listening to this. So inshallah we'll ask them as well to maybe have some more more things uh you know, inshallah, in the future. But this whole family gathering is generally things that will revolve around families. So a lot of things may have already been covered in previous lectures, which you'll also find on the Islamic uh, Information Center Dubai YouTube, inshallah. Um, how do you deal with a 12-year-old? A lot of perhaps genetic negativity. This is on the child uh, has enough advice, love, Islamic knowledge and advice yet. Okay, again, they're 12. They're still, I mean, 
it's difficult to say they've had enough advice or enough love. The love is ongoing, the advice is ongoing, the Islamic knowledge is definitely ongoing, and it may just be a phase they're going through. Like you said, it may be a genetic thing. Just have to try and deal with it. When they're negative, try and be positive. When they're when they when they when they're being you know uh, pessimism, be have optimism with them, and, and it just keep on going on as long as it's not resulting in any really you know like aggressive behavior or very you know out of control and then maybe that maybe that could be seen again there's a problem you know when it goes to child psychologists or whatever it may be behavior experts are they within the islamic boundaries or not or they you know talk about things that you know we don't agree with as muslims but if it's something that's not like out of control to that kind of level extreme level then it's just a waiting game you know just a waiting game having patience always they're negative positive they have pessimism, you have optimism. Allah Um Okay, inshallah, barakallah feekum. It's been a long one. Barakallah feekum, Allah khair for tuning in. Anything that I have said which is correct is by the blessings and the tawfiq from Allah. Anything I have said is incorrect is indeed from myself and from the shaitan. And inshallah, until future less, uh, lectures, bi'inanillah, I leave you inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.